Can you hear what it is yet? We got it. You there yet? <laughs> That's the difficult bit. <laughs> Thank you. That was, of course, the opening of the finale of Beethoven's First Symphony, as some people recognised. I'm sorry, I couldn't make it more recognisable than that, but it hasn't been long. Um, that's what it should be. Uh, and that's what Beethoven wrote at the opening of the last movement of his first symphony. And it's funny. I mean, it was funny there for the wrong reasons, but it's funny. It's a laughter of recognition. The audience recognises the pattern of that major scale. You first do hear the... And then you hear... And you think, oh, I know what's going on here. And then this is the clever bit. He then builds it up and then has a piano at the top note. And then you think, you know, and then he has a pianist. And then you're off into the thing. But it is very clearly, very clearly a joke. There we go. And it is, in, a, in an 1800 kind of way, it is very funny indeed. And we're not, but we know, we know that we're not uh, making up the, uh, we know we're not making up the humour um, here, because um, in 1809, so when the symphony was only nine years old, uh, the conductor Daniel Turk, uh, who was conducting the Music Society in Halle, actually removed that opening because he didn't want the audience to laugh. I mean, it strikes me as an odd thing to want to do, because presumably Beethoven put it there because he wanted to start the last movement with a joke. But it, what it proves is that actually we're not wrong in finding it funny when we do, and that Daniel Turk thought it was too funny to be performed. The very opening of the first movement of Beethoven's first symphony is itself uh, unusual. Maybe not to our ears so much, To our ears, that sounds perfectly doable, except in 1800, you don't start a piece with a dissonance. It's not a nasty noise, but it's a chord that needs resolution. And that's not how you start a symphony in C major. You start a symphony in C major with C major in some shape or form, not. So it's a deliberate attempt to get the audience to listen. And there's also, a keen eye of you, there's also some pizzicato work going on here, some plucking work going on in the strings. It is an unusual opening. It's designed, again, gently so, but it's designed to get people to sit up and concentrate. And this is the problem with, problem with looking back in history at music like this, is that that, to us, sounds an absolutely standard opening. But it is not. It's a gently difficult, dissonant, enigmatic start of a symphony, and particularly in this case because it's Beethoven's first symphony. So here's the opening of the first movement.
So that's the unsettling and attention-grabbing opening of Beethoven's first symphony in C major. Um, we have to put our 1800 ears on, as I say, and to quote another famous opening, that's to say the one from L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there, and that's exactly what we've experienced there. Um, Beethoven had composition lessons with Haydn from November 1792 to January 1794, just for 14 months, and famously they didn't get on. Uh, it's odd, we, one really wants Beethoven and Haydn to have got on, but they didn't. Um, but clearly Beethoven did learn a lot from Haydn, um, and here are two unusual openings of Haydn's string quartets, both written in the short window in which Haydn was teaching Beethoven, in which you can see that it clearly gave Beethoven ideas. Up at the top there, we have uh, Op 74, number one, as I say, written when Haydn was studying, uh, Haydn was teaching Beethoven, and it starts not unlike the symphony we just heard, it starts like this. And then we're off. But the opening gesture is unusual. It's very Haydn-esque. It's surprising, slightly jokey, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But that's, that was written during the time uh, that uh, Haydn was teaching Beethoven. Beethoven would have known that. Uh, and also beneath it, another one that uh, Haydn wrote, um, sorry, that Haydn wrote while he was um, teaching Beethoven. This, even odder, just a straightforward chord. And off we hear it, but just, and a huge chord as well. As you can see, there are actually 12 notes split over four instruments, and there's only 16 possible strings in a string quartet, so to use 12 of them. It's a big opening, again, a short, perfunctory opening, must have been known to Beethoven. Haydn was teaching Beethoven at the time. And I think that um, has its uh, um, uh, outlet in this piece, which um, even if you don't recognize the notes on the page, you will uh, recognize the um, uh, title at the top, Symphony Number no. 3, the Eroica, Symphonia Eroica, and here, that's exactly how that starts. What we should expect at the beginning of a Beethoven symphony at that time is a slow introduction, something like this. That's what you'd expect, and that's not what you get. What you get here, crash, and then a second crash, and then you're straight into it. So no introduction at all, two great hammer blow chords. Leonard Bernstein said that the first two movements, uh, movements of the Eroica Symphony are perhaps the greatest two movements in all symphonic music, and I'm not going to disagree with him. Indeed, there is clear blue water between the structure and the sound world of Beethoven's second and his third symphonies, and they were pretty much written one after the other, but in terms of the, the sound of it, the sound world of it, in terms of the form and the structure, Beethoven III is a million miles away from Beethoven II. And that's probably why people place, if, if people are going to um, divide Beethoven's career up into periods, which um, music historians always do, uh, that's where you put the divide between the early period and the middle period, is between Beethoven II and Beethoven III. And when you listen to those two pieces, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, here's another monumentally uh, exciting opening chord. You doubtless all know uh, the sound of this chord, uh, the very opening of Hard Day's Night. It's the most discussed pop opening of all time. And the reason it's so much discussed is that nobody can actually agree what the notes are in it. So I thought I'd just chuck in my 
uh, idea of what it, what it is. Some, some bits are verifiable, some bits are not, but the point is that nobody can actually agree. But it does seem, this, as I say, this is very much my view, and it's not gospel, uh, that you had uh, George Martin, he was playing a Steinway, he was playing a piano, and he seems to have had these, these notes. Uh, Paul McCartney on his uh, electric bass had that. Again, that's verifiable. We know that that note is the one that he played. We also know that he played it actually high up on his D string, so he played it in, in a position he didn't need to. He played it an octave above that open string. Uh, George Harrison on his 12 string electric seems to be playing this. John Lennon on his six string acoustic seems to be playing this. So. Uh, Ringo Starr very gently playing his ride cymbal and his snare drum. Now, if I were, because I do, if I were to be uh, anal analyzing this in terms of uh, harmony and counterpoint, <laughs> I would probably describe it as a seventh chord on the second degree of the scale. So we're in C major, nicely. And then that's our uh, seventh chord on the second degree. And we're also adding an eleventh as well. That's basically, so in terms of the harmony, in terms of the function of the chord, which makes sense, that's what it is. But if you put all these things together, the piano, the bass, the electric guitar, the acoustic guitar, and very subtle, just a, a bit of cymbal and drum, you do get a phenomenal chord. One of the reasons that I think it's impossible for us strictly to replicate it is, of course, there's lots of stuff going on in the box in terms of how the thing is mixed and the various uh, relationships between the instruments when it goes through the electronics. But the effect is unlike any other. As I say, I probably haven't described it correctly, but this is it. It's been a hard day's night And I've been working like a dog it is a remarkable chord and, as I say, a very difficult to reconstruct. Where were we? Um, Beethoven. Um, so the, um, the third symphony was premiered in 1805 and in the following year Beethoven wrote his fourth. And the opening of the fourth creates musical space like never before. And I've been trying to think over the last few weeks, what is it that you need to be able to create musical space? And I think one of the things you need is you need some kind of sustained work. And here we have sustained notes. And the other thing is that I think you need a very slow and obvious harmony. But the crucial thing is, of course, that it moves slowly against, I think, against that uh, sustained note there. And this is the opening of Beethoven's fourth uh, symphony. And I think this does create musical space uh, such as had not been created before that time. And now here's a spacious opening from uh, two centuries later. Um, this one I think is fascinating, not least because it creates musical space so brilliantly, but because um, for those of you that can follow a score in any other way, that just does not in any way uh, uh, transmit, I think, the idea of just how spacious and beautiful and wonderful and innovative uh, this writing from 1910 was. That just looks like any other score, and actually it's a most remarkable bit of writing. Just those few uh, chords at the beginning of Vaughan Williams's Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis. Uh, for double string orchestra bits, you can see there's a string quartet at the top. There's a string quartet at the top. Then one string orchestra, and then another string orchestra. So a lot of string players. It was premiered at the Three Choirs Festival in Gloucester on the 10th of September 1910. And because you're covering such a huge amount of space on those string instruments, right from the high notes right down to the low notes, right the double basses and then the violins high up here, 
it covers an awful lot of space, and that does give you the feeling of space, and also with the slow-moving harmonies. Now, after the premiere of Vaughan Williams's Talis Fantasia, the young Herbert Howells and Ivor Gurney spent the night walking the streets of Gloucester because their imaginations had been so fired by the piece. Now, here's another 20th century opening that I believe was very much influenced by the Vaughan Williams Fantasia. This is the opening of Pink Floyd's um, concept album, Wish You Were Here, recorded over several tortuous months in 1975. It was Pink Floyd's next album after Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, it took them an awful lot of time uh, and it wasn't a happy process. Uh, that static chord, this G minor chord that you'll hear now, stays there for two and a quarter minutes. And the chord is spaced across the whole region of the orchestra, but actually it's not a symphony orchestra, it's a Solina string synthesizer, which in 1975 was a very new bit of kit, and I think you'll agree it does an extremely good job, uh, especially for 1975. The song is a tribute to former band member Sid Barrett, who left the band seven years earlier, um, a very troubled soul, and that's the whole point of this opening and the whole point indeed of the album, Wish You Were Here. just about to change chord to D minor. Extraordinary opening, it really is. These days, I think it's fair to say we are quite used, indeed almost expect, uh, slow music, music that doesn't do much for a very long time, but in 1975, that was an extraordinary thing to have written. Um, here's another piece that's about static harmony. Um, you may not be familiar with this notation, uh, and that's fair enough. Uh, this is, as it says at the top, this is Perrotin's Viderunt Omnes, we might, I say we grandly, but musicologists might uh, be prepared to say that it was actually written for Christmas Day of 1198 uh, to be performed in the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris. You don't know many specific dates in the medieval period, but this is, a, this is one that people hang on to. So it could have been, certainly the text Fidei and Omnes is a Christmas Day text, and it could have been that this is when it was first performed, 1198 in Notre Dame de Paris. Um, it would have certainly fitted the acoustical space of the new building, which was being, being built at the time. It hadn't been completed, but there was enough of it, I think, for a piece like this to be appropriate. What you have here, uh, just for the record, you have a four-part piece. There's a, uh, one part there, there's one part there, and there's one part there. So these three parts are doing stuff at the top. And then along the bottom here, there's one part that just holds a note for a very long time. Changes there. Changes syllable there, but not note and then changes note 
here. And that is a slowed down piece of plain chant, the plain chant, and so on. And you just have the first note, for a long time, and then the second note, for a long time, and then, and that movement of that chord from that note to that note at that point is an extraordinary moment. So that's what you have here. You have a very slow harmonic rhythm. Again, I would suggest that's creating some kind of space. I don't think it's too fanciful to say that you are witnessing the time, the building of the new cathedral of Notre Dame. And so writing something spacious to fit that space seems to be entirely uh, in keeping. Uh, and it is an extraordinary sound. There may be one, but we don't know a four-part piece of music, a piece for four voices earlier than this, but 1198, Christmas Day 1198 could have witnessed, well, did witness something spectacular in the performance of this piece, but it could have witnessed something that was genuinely mind-blowing or ear-blowing uh, ear, 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 uh, for the people that were listening. The a change of chord. So uh, 50 seconds on V, another 25 on D for finally moving. Again, wonderful slow moving harmonies to create the sense of musical space. Uh, where were we? We were with Beethoven, obviously. Um, the it's difficult to say if it's the most famous opening of all time, but it's certainly one of the uh, more famous openings, the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is often, and in fact, indeed, in the, in the, uh, um, uh, advert uh, the advertising for this lecture, I did describe, I did at least mention the four-note motif that begins uh, the Fifth Symphony. But actually, it's not really a four-note motif. It's actually a five-event motif. There are indeed four notes, and you, oh, sorry. There are indeed four notes. You can see them here, and you'll know what they are. Da, 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 da. But the crucial thing here is the rest at the start. And that, it strikes me, is actually just as important. It's difficult uh, for members of the audience because it's very difficult to hear a rest. But a conductor, however, can indicate it. Some conductors choose to start absolutely right on, on the music. Ba, 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 ba. That's how it's sometimes done. But I would always uh, recommend actually to conduct the rest because I think it's all part of the energy of the piece. <coughs> da, 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 da. And it does make a big difference because, of course, that motif, as it goes throughout the whole movement, <coughs> da, 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 integral to the way in which it works, is actually that rest that begins it. So I would, I would describe it as a five-event motif rather than a four-note motif. Um, uh, it's, we, we don't know, but it's always of, often quoted that uh, Beethoven said that this was fate knocking on the door. That's probably made up by um, his biographer, but it does fit. If you want to think of it like that, uh, you can. Here's uh, Carlos Kleiber doing it. <laughs> Thank you. 
But let's go right um, back to the beginning. Um, how did the earliest Western music begin? And the answer is, well, plain chant began simply as a way of enhancing words. So if you have, um, let us say, uh, the first commandment, Audi Israel, in Latin, Dominus Deus Noster, Dominus Unus Est. I could speak it like that, but that's not going to project very well without the aid of the microphone. That's not going to project very well. If I'm doing it for a long time, it's easier to sing than it is to speak prolonged periods. Um, it makes it more momentous. It makes the words more audible or should do. It's better at projecting things. So in other words, rather than saying Audi Israel, Dominus Deus Noster, Dominus Unus Est, I would be better, I think, to go Audi Israel, Dominus Deus Noster, Dominus Unus Est, and that has gravity and you can hear the words and it, it's doing something with it. Now that's the most basic plain chant, is just improvising it to one note. And then what gradually would have happened is people starting to punctuate their openings. Audi Israel, Dominus Deus Noster, Dominus Unus Est, something like that, respecting the natural word stress. And even when the chant becomes more complicated, uh, it still seems to follow the basic rise and fall of the speech pattern. Deus creator omnium, you might have sung on Christmas Day morning. Deus creator omnium. Deus creator omnium. All the chants, in some basic way, follow the words. So that's your openings in plain chant, is simply following uh, the text. And here it is sung by people that know what they're doing. Now, the whole point about plain chant is it has this natural rise and fall that is all about the speech rhythms. It's not in any particular kind of rhythm. So somebody would be... I think doing a gross disservice, you might even say, if you were going to try and make that have some kind of rhythmic uh, background. Yes, of course, uh, this is what happened in the late 20th century quite a lot. Plain chant was sampled, a beat was put behind it. Um, and of course, it does have a certain, uh, I shouldn't say choir, I suppose, in that it, it, it gives a kind of postmodern feel to it. But what it actually does, of course, is take away anything that's specifically about uh, the plain chant. So here's what happened in 1990s, that lovely bit of chant. to judge, obviously, but I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> when uh, there was a yen, for whatever reason, to elaborate chant and to make it more interesting, as it were, or have more moment by uh, harmonizing, or what was called organum, simple organum or free organum. This is described in about the year 900 and saying this is what you do. So basically, if you want to make something a bit more interesting, you take a chant that you know. That chant might be... Tu patri sempiternus es filius. And you go to uh, half of the choir. Why don't you sing it up a particular interval and it'll sound grander. Tu patri sempiternus es filius. And indeed it does. The crucial thing is nobody needs to learn anything new. You just do the thing that you know, but half the choir does it up. And that's, uh, that's your simple organum. Free organum is a little bit more complicated. You have um, Rex Celi Domine Maris Undi Soni. And then another part of the choir would begin on the same note, finish on the end note, and then do something vaguely parallel in the middle. Tu patri sempiternus, sorry. Rex celi domine maris undi soni. 
and again, you have another way of harmonizing. But the point is, this is improvised. Quite recently, uh, in 2010, um, somebody discovered something extraordinary. Now, uh, the interval ratios that um, medieval uh, musicians used to create this organum effect were fairly obvious. You either did it at the octave, a nice consonant interval whose frequency ratio is two to one, or three to two at a perfect fifth, you can, or uh, four to three at the perfect fourth. I think most people thought that that's what it was. So in other words, a musical opening in organum would be at an octave, a fifth, or a fourth. And then a piece was described, uh, was, was, was discovered in London. Uh, note this, five, five to four, major third, a very dissonant sound to uh, uh, medieval ears, except this was discovered, possibly dating from about 900, possibly coming from northwest Germany. Uh, and it seems to indicate that actually this begins on the interval of a third. Now, I'm, like you, maybe not a particular uh, expert in Paleo-Frankish notation, maybe, maybe some of you are, but uh, this does seem to indicate that there is a starting note on a third, which would have been really quite a dissonant interval to the medieval ear. To our ear, it sounds lovely. Sancte Bonifati Marti. But it's the rest of the chant I can get, it's that. That starts on something, it's a very, very modern sound to start anything on. Moving forward 200 years, here you have a piece by Leonan, Vider and Omnes. The bottom part here, so there's a two part piece. There's the top part, which has got a lot to do, and then beneath it, a piece of slowed down plain chant. Taking a long time and over the top of it. This is definitely not improvised music. This is very highly specialized, uh, sophisticated, composed music. But here you have the chant which has been elaborated. But you just have the first V and then derunt. And the top part improvises over the top. Now, if you look at the start there, I would have said, and maybe you would do too, that the two voices start simultaneously. But actually, certain people believe that they did not, and that actually what you hear is the, the top voice starting on its own, and then the bottom voice joining at that point. And this uh, is the sound that you have. Whereas others believe that actually the two voices do start simultaneously, so if you have your pieces, that actually that highly dissonant seventh interval now, which even now we would we'd bulk at starting a piece like that, if the two piece if the two voices did indeed start simultaneously, that's what you have. very different effect indeed uh, and it's one of the things that makes talking about medieval openings uh, very difficult as you actually know if it starts like that or like entirely different effects just don't know or at least I don't um, by the time you get to the Renaissance essentially there are two ways of starting a piece one is where you start all the voices together and they more or less sing at the same time as each other. So-called homophony, a homophonic piece of writing. This is a piece of bird uh, in ex doing exactly that. All the voices start at the same time. Very beautiful it is too. 
The other way of doing it is to have this kind of texture, a so-called polyphonic texture, where all the voices share the same sort of music, but they sing at different times. So one voice comes in here, comes in there, goes its own sweet way, another voice comes in here, so-called polyphonic rendition, a very different style of writing. You can make a particular point, uh, depending on the notes that you use. Here's the famous uh, Gesualdo doing it his way. Uh, and his way is to make very clear his guilt for the fact that, uh, albeit legally, murdered his wife uh, and her lover. Uh, but it was legal. Um, they were caught, he caught them um, in flagrante, as it were. But anyway, so the, it, it's not the fact that uh, it was illegal, it's the fact that he clearly, and you might, uh, felt guilty afterwards, and uh, that found its way into his music in many, many different ways, not least uh, in this motet, um, Pecantum me quotidie, as I was sinning daily. This is obviously a, a, a text that he wanted to set. And so the first thing that he does is, nobody goes down by descending six at this point. It's an illegal thing to do, it's a sin. And then the next thing that he does is he brings in this dissonance unprepared. You don't do that either. You have to prepare a dissonance and you don't go around leaping downwards by intervals of a six. He is, he is sinning and making it very clear uh, that this is his guilt, but he's doing it through the music. another way of doing it. Um, that piece was published in 1603, and in 1607, Claudio Monteverdi did something uh, extraordinary. He wrote uh, the most colorful of the early operas, dare I say the greatest of the early operas, uh, and he began uh, just with instruments. And that is the wonderful change that you get at the beginning of the Baroque era, is instruments do making statements that hitherto voices would have done. Um, he's using the basic tools of the trade uh, in that you know, he's got things we're acquainted with on the two lowest notes. He's got a nice, good, solid, open fifth there. He's got some arpeggios going on here in the middle of the texture and so on. And then he's got a scale right at the top there. It puts it all together and you have this. So that's in the first decade of the 17th century, how you begin an opera. How would you begin a church piece? Well, kind of in the same way, you just have the choir singing the words of the opening of Vespers in a chord that fits with the toccata. So on. The point is here that instruments from this period are able to create ceremonial openings. They're, enab they're enabled to. They can paint the sort of pictures pictures that previously would have been left to voices. Here's a famous opening from later. This is from 
the early 1850s. This is from the opening of Wagner's Ring Cycle. This is the, the, the opening of Das Rheingold. And this is essentially an expansive elaboration of just one chord, four and a half minutes of it, just in the chord uh, of E flat major. As you can see, it starts with your eight double basses, and then your three bassoons join, and then at the bottom here, the horns come in, and eighth, eighth horn, seventh horn, sixth horn, so and so, so forth, four and a half minutes of E flat major depicting the Rhine. It's an awful lot of um, E flat major, and it's a very good way of depicting the flowing of the River Rhine. But why E flat? Somebody did some research, fortunately, a few years ago. In the 1850s in Germany, thunderflush toilets were bigger than ours are today. And indeed, the thunderflush toilet of the German 1850s used to resonate at the note of E flat. The point is, <laughs> when Wagner heard running water, he heard an E flat. So if you are going to depict the Rhine, this, uh, I'm not making this up, you couldn't. You couldn't. Obviously, you would subliminally use the key of E flat, because that's what you associate with running water. Um, Wagner's more famous opening is that of uh, Tristan uh, and Isolde, and it's focusing around this so-called Tristan chord. And the reason that it's famous, I mean, quite apart from the fact that it's beautiful, is that this is cited as being the first atonal opening of a piece. Not that atonal means it's a nasty noise, it's not. It's just that you don't know what key you're in. And that happens through these opening three statements from the orchestra. You are lost. fabulous atonal opening of Tristan and Isolde, of Wagner. Debussy had many problems with Wagner, although like a lot of artists that have problems with people, he was highly influenced by him. Uh, this is his um, prelude to the afternoon of a fawn, and this does a similar thing in that 
you don't know where you are at the start of it because it's outlining this flute melody here. Outlines this interval here. That interval there that tells you nothing about the key that you're in. Again, another beautiful, not unpleasant noise, but a beautiful atonal opening. And although by a Russian composer, Stravinsky, the Rite of Spring was first performed in Paris in 1913, famously you might know, it, 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 it caused a riot, partly because of its music, but probably because of the costumes and the choreography. The choreography. But I think um, Marina Falova Walker will talk about this in January when she talks about the Rite. Um, but there seem to have been a lot of reasons uh, that this caused a riot at its first performance. But one of them was certainly the very opening of uh, the piece which begins with the ballet, which begins with a bassoon very high up in its register. And people apparently started to, to imitate that and to cat's call when they heard this high bassoon note. It's interesting to point out now that any first year undergraduate can play that high C uh, with alacrity. I mean, that's how things have gone on. But I did a bit of research. In, in 1913, the 100 meters record was 10.6 seconds. Now we can do it in 9.58. So it just shows, you know, we can run faster now and we play high notes on the bassoon. But you have, again, to put your 1913 ears on to realize how extraordinary this would have sounded at the time. And to finish with, I'd like to stay with Russia and to play my two favorite uh, musical openings of all time. One of them uh, you might be surprised at, but it's because um, I like the, the disruptive nature of it in what is normally regarded as not a very disruptive piece at all. This is the opening of Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. You might recognize it, you'll, you'll see that the horns begin there with that famous call, and then the orchestra punctuate, here we are, it's Piano Concerto uh, in B-flat minor. It's all doing what it should do until uh, the piano comes in. You can see there, the piano comes in and all of a sudden we're in D-flat major. Why? This is a Piano Concerto in B-flat minor. But we have this, and even better than that, so the piano joint and then the, and then the strings have this wonderful tune which has got nothing to do with anything. It's not the first subject. The first subject is a few minutes down the line. That's going to be a, a nice Ukrainian folk song in B-flat minor. But there's this wonderful, the bit that everybody knows from the Tchaikovsky piano concerto is the bit that in one sense is not meant to be there. This is a grand theme of some sort, but it's got nothing to do with the structure of it. So, so the piece behaves extremely well for a few bars, but then not. <laughs> Um, the Hungarian composer Jörg Kurtag wrote a homage to Tchaikovsky in 1973, uh, in which he wanted to give the impression, um, 
His uh, series of, of piano works for children uh, is called Games, and it's been going on for years. Uh, and in 1973, he began, and in his first volume, he wrote his homage to Tchaikovsky, and it was to give the idea to children of what it might feel like to play the Tchaikovsky piano concerto, but without actually being able to play the piano very well. Ladies and gentlemen, we can now all, if we can't play the Tchaikovsky piano concerto, I have, I hope, given you a way in which you can perform Kurtag's homage to Tchaikovsky and have just as much fun as if you were playing the Tchaikovsky piano concerto. Thank you. <laughs>